I am Shua. And you are listening to Light Up with Shua, a weekly podcast to open our hearts and minds on a journey with me. Hello and good afternoon, uh, Jonathan Perry. Hello, Waniki Sak. Waniki Sak, that is how you say it? That is a good day oh, in Wampanoag, which would be our uh, our language for the Wampanoag Nation. Thank you. Oh, that's wonderful. So, how do you say hello? You can say cha if you'd like, cha? which is uh, hi, hello. Hi. Cha. Is there cha. any other word also? Uh, Wanikisa, uh, d- depending on the time of day, okay. uh, you may say good morning or good afternoon, or wow. good evening, or something of that nature. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could say Kawikwasan, uh, which is uh, specifically in the early light hours of the day mm-hmm. uh, and sp- speaks to when the first light touches your skin. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for taking out time and thank you for being here. Um, I would like, this is a Thanksgiving week, so I wanted to get a perspective from the native person. What do you think Thanksgiving is and was, was and is? There's so many ways to answer the question of what Thanksgiving symbolizes and means to indigenous people or to Wampanoag people or to modern Americans, which Native people obviously are a part of. It's, it's a hard question to answer, even from, from my perspective. Hmm. Uh, ultimately, we're, we're children or we're young adults and we're raised in a society that uh, has a five-day work week and has a five-day school period for children. So you really you look to the weekends and you look for those holidays as a special time to have off, right? Mm-hmm. Just to spend time with your family or to go see a movie or uh, to go hiking or fishing or you know whatever it is that you do and the way that you reconnect to your normal life mm. from these sort of forced distractions or uh, necessities for for development, right? Mm-hmm. And so I think we're caught in a funny place where we as, as Native people still recognize the need for time off and for celebration time mm-hmm. and to reconnect with family and, and get rid of that stress that's built up over time, right? Mm -hmm. And so on one hand, we're celebrating a period of time where we're able to just relax and, and do that, you know, go for a hike in the woods or, you know, something of that nature. On the other hand, it's focused on a time in history that brought about a great deal of change and horrific life loss, loss of rights, loss of religious freedom, loss of uh, continuity, loss of our economy, right? I mean, ultimately, where the country is celebrating this particular arrival of a vessel and a small group of people who had no legal right to set foot on and take resources from an established and longstanding nation that existed in that, in that area Mm -hmm. of, I mean, that's just one section of our entire tribal nation Mm -hmm. and our tribal nation sits on just one section of a continent covered by tribal nations that had borders, rights, laws, a system of doing things and, um, governmental protocols and leadership, etc. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So those were existing things that go back to the time of the glacial uh, 
moraine that existed here. Mm -hmm. And we don't actually know how far back it goes. I mean, ultimately, archaeology can prove 13 to 14,000 years in just my region alone Mm. of continual life and habitation by indigenous people. Mm -hmm. But then we really don't know what the glacial uh, tilling that occurred eradicated, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different lot of different things here uh, wrapped up in this story. For me, as a modern Wampanoag person Mm -hmm. who studies history and has worked in museums and interpreted this period of time and talked about older information and our continuance up to present day activities as indigenous people, we, my, my, my whole view of it is that we are not important because we happen to be living in a specific piece of land where a boat full of people from another place saw us, wrote a little bit about us, and were dependent upon us to keep them alive. Mm. Right? That that Mayflower arrival off the coast in, in uh, 1620, November 9th of 1620, the first landing on the shore... Uh, in on November 11th of 1620, and the subsequent uh, sort of looting that, that occurred on the Cape when they dug into corn storage pits and stole stole the resources out of the food stores that Native people had set for the winter, mm-hmm. uh, the unearthing of burials out on the Cape, and then of course the retaliatory uh, the the sort of um, the response that they got, basically, of Nauset Wampanoag people attacking them and driving them off of mm-hmm. Cape Cod was, it was, response, it was a response to people who didn't come ashore and immediately seek out leadership and have a discussion mm. about whether they had the right to stop in, whether they were welcome, uh, whether they could rely on on people to help support them since they arrived at the worst time of year. Mm. And really the onset of winter mm. with very little resources and no knowledge of the land. Mm. Uh, so obviously they were going to be dependent on Native people, whether it was through stealing resources that they thought no one could stop them from taking or... Mm or wouldn't be around for that period of time, or whether they were going to physically be demanding food and shelter. So ultimately, from, from an indigenous point of view, this was... It was a time of change, but it wasn't really a defining moment for my nation. It's some unfortunate occurrences in a long-standing history of my people from obviously a english perspective it was it was a pivotal moment because it was sort of it was the first attempted colony in the northern part of what they were calling the new world mm. uh, what we would typically refer to as turtle island mm-hmm. uh, speaking to the creation stories of you know how the turtle uh, held the first uh, the first land that was brought up from the bottom of the sea, and then the turtle grew to a massive size, and the earth covered that turtle's back, and that was the creation of the land for for us to to walk upon and live upon because we couldn't exist in the water. And so, to us, Turtle Island is is a sacred place that has in perpetuity. Uh, provided all of our needs and protection and nourishment and and is you know the mother of of our existence right mm. the for the English it was a uh, resource rich area that they could establish businesses on to increase their profits or their holdings or their family names mm. in another in another country. And I think that this society in a lot of ways has 
has built up upon those same principles, even though the 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 families are now however many generations into the this uh, immigration, right? So you know they're they're Tony generations in or, or whatever the number of generations are since you know the the Mayflower, um, or or if you're talking about Virginia sixteen the earlier period of 1600, 1607, I think, around that time frame. Mm. Uh, there hasn't been this, there's not this many thousands of years of developing a society and a balance and a view mm. of the resources. There's not the um, careful monitoring of resource use and development to protect your water sources and your mm. food sources and your... Um, your efforts to maintain a very carefully crafted society mm. uh, for time and memorial, right? And, and for many future generations. Uh, that's, that's not the mindset, right? Mm. Uh, the, the English arrived, they were driven off the Cape, they, they sailed north around, uh, around the, you know, along the coastline and end up putting in to Plymouth Harbor, where they they kind of, quote-unquote, settle. Essentially, you know, they squatted because they went into a very coastal area in the, in, in the early winter mm -hmm. when Wampanoag people would have completely moved from the coastal areas and moved into sheltered valleys. For the wintertime. Into our, our winter homes, yes. Because no, no one wants to live on the beach right. in New England in, in, in the winter. Cold, it's, yeah. it's tough. It's different. Yeah. Um, and so Wampanoag people established two, two village sites, essentially, and, mm. and had big winter homes and small summer houses. Mm. Because in the summertime, you would spend most of your time outdoors mm -hmm. and, you know, you would be fishing or you'd be swimming at the beach mm. or... You would be out, you know, growing corn and, mm. you know, harvesting, you know, your first berries like strawberries and things of that nature that you're encouraging to grow around your community. So you're pretty busy, but you're also enjoying the beautiful weather that the outdoors has, uh, what, what is provided in New England. Mm -hmm. So when the English arrive... There's an area that's that's kind of impacted negatively by sicknesses. Um, it's believed because there was um, exposed remains uh, of people. There were houses that were falling to ruin. Um, so very near to that arrival time, sicknesses had affected the Patuxet area of Plymouth. You know what is referred to as Plymouth today. Patuxet mm. is our name for it. And between people not being on the coastline and not monitoring things because of the time of year mm -hmm. or not monitoring as regularly mm -hmm. because of population impacts in certain areas uh, as a result of European sicknesses that were coming through with slavers and fishermen and explorers and harvesters of, of goods, resources like wood, mm -hmm. uh, those, those interactions cause sicknesses to start to infiltrate our societies. That was a, a problem that we were, we were unfortunately dealing with in mm. the 15 and 1600s, mm. and it took us uh, quite a long time to, uh, to find our balance in that because we're now being exposed to sicknesses we had no familiarity That's with. That's what I was going to ask, and you were, thank you. Yeah, I was going yes. to ask, like, were you, did you have diseases or sicknesses, like, similar to what you were encountering at that time? No. No, not really. There's actually very little to no known sicknesses that are, um, originate from our society. Mm. I mean, one, we, we were very clean people, you know, so very the, the alternative, actually, like the herbalist, uh, the, 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 yes. the things that you guys use. I mean, I'm learning a little bit about it, but I'm very on the alternative side as well. 
Yeah. So there are so many native uh, native herbs that they say this is this is native from here. So yes. it's like yeah, of course. I mean, there must be well, some healing. And even even today, uh, it, I think the estimates are sixty five percent of modern pharmaceuticals are synthetic copies of native medicines from here. Ah. Uh, a good portion of those medicines originating in the Northeast or were similar medicines to the, uh, what were being produced by similar species of plants and certain, uh, you know, certain methods of mm-hmm. making medicines in other parts of the country, mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. Because obviously our people didn't exist in bubbles. We had a great deal of commerce and trade and uh, we had um, access with many tribal nations through our waterways mm-hmm. and highways that we built. As a matter of fact, the English, when they landed in Plymouth, they talk about how they built upon the highway. Mm. So that wasn't that wasn't an English highway. That was a native m- main road, mm. which became what, what's known as Route 3 today oh. in Plymouth, Massachusetts, okay. and, and goes all the way to the Cape and all the way up mm-hmm. to Boston area. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the highways and a lot of the main routes, a lot of the railways across the United States were built on established native roads that the English said in the 1600s were better maintained and better established than anything you would find in Europe. Mm. So very different, obviously, from the unpeopled, unimproved landscape that Mm. the English touted in their journals or their writings that gave them... Um, sort of this idea that they could just uh, they could just take as much as they wanted. Mm. You know, that was the that was the mindset because the people here didn't look like them or speak like them because we didn't go to church mm-hmm. because we didn't improve quote unquote improve the land in their fashion. Mm-hmm. It, we didn't deserve to have it, and we didn't have a right to claim it. So, which they themselves contradict in every writing they make uh, mm. in that time period. So, you know, they talk about it being unpeopled, and then they talk about all the, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of people that they see on a regular basis. They talk about no improvements, and then they talk about superior roads than what they have. Mm. Uh, they talk about... Uh, how we were primitive and yet constantly talk about how much better everything that we did was than the way they did it in their own lands. Mm. You know, to the point that they talk about alcoholic beverages freezing in their houses in the winter Mm. and our houses so hot that they had to shed layers of clothing because they were overheating and sweating and it was uncomfortable. Mm. So... So, so this you're talking from the books or the, whatever they wrote in the history? Absolutely. That, mm-hmm. That's, you know, a yeah. Plymouth Plantation written mm-hmm. by William Bradford. That's, mm-hmm. you know, Mort's Relations mm-hmm. uh, being writ- written by Edward Winslow. That's, mm. uh, you know, the various uh, first and second person sources of the time period, ship's journals, mm-hmm. uh, you know, in in individual writings mm. of people who were interacting in that time period. Mm. And so, but there, there's ultimately a lot to it. The For Wampanoag people, I think, I think, as I said before, we're torn because we have time off and because it it's a convenient period in which to feast and acknowledge family or to travel and visit family if you're away from them. Um, If you're a Native person, a Native student Mm -hmm. going to a university, the schools typically give part of this week off for Mm -hmm. folks to reconnect with their families. So whether you like it or not as a Native person, whether you would wish to protest Thanksgiving or or to not regard it in any way, shape, or form, mm. you're you're forced to acknowledge it in some fashion because you can't just go to a store on a normal schedule because people are home mm. on this holiday. Mm. But you you are encouraged to eat certain eat certain foods in celebration of this 
holiday because it's on sale, because it's readily available, because other things aren't available at the same time. Uh, so it's really, it's hard to not acknowledge it if you wanted to pretend it didn't exist, really. So, so do you celebrate then, like not celebrate, I don't know, what should I say? Like I need to understand, so your nation or some of you maybe do celebrate or some have, like do you celebrate or do you just go with the flow or do you, like I don't see pr protests as such either, like right? Well, there, there is, there was there is. the uh, suppressed Thanksgiving address uh, from my cousin, Frank James, mm -hmm. who started the National Day of Mourning um, and the protests of Thanksgiving in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Okay. Uh, and that's happened annually since since that beginning. So uh, where can I find this if I want to put the link on my website about when I'm talking to you? Like, is there a link or did they... Did they uh, uh, film it or is there, and like how can people learn about this? Is there writing about it? Yes. I mean, I think it, it ends up being in the news sometimes. Okay. Uh, obviously, if you Google okay. National Day of Mourning, National Day of Mourning. Um, okay. you'll, you'll find I'll, some information it. on it. There's, um, you know, Roland James. Roland? Uh, Roland? Roland. Okay, R-O-L-A-N-D, -A -A Roland James. Okay who he, that's Frank James's son, okay. and is, uh, I think, one of the main organizers of the National Day of Mourning, mm -hmm. and, you know, keeping that sort of tradition alive. Mm -hmm. uh, I've attended numerous uh, protests, mm -hmm. as hasn't, you know, pretty much most of the Wampanoag people who are involved in, in the nation mm -hmm. and in, in our... Uh, in our communities today, I think most folks have attended or participated or spoken uh -huh. at, at that event over the years. So and basically, so, what, so you so don't want to celebrate, is, basically. So you're just taking off because you have to take off. Yeah, I, I think ultimately everyone is going to give you a slightly different answer okay. to it. You know, okay. some folks, I don't think any any Native folks that I know Mm -hmm. celebrate Thanksgiving like the way the typical American does, you know, because inherently it just doesn't have the same warm, fuzzy feeling. You know, we, we're constantly reminded when we look around about all the lands that were forcibly removed from our society. Yeah. We look around at how well everyone has done off of indigenous knowledge. Mm -hmm. Whether you're talking about the pharmaceutical companies oh, or you're wow. talking about the logging companies or the mineral harvesting companies mm -hmm. or you're talking about, you know, the, the massive land grabs that turned certain farming families into these, you know, uh, huge landholders where, you know, in a single English family took the entire land holdings of of a whole Wampanoag community, mm. you know. Mm. So obviously so they so, don't refer to that. Well, no. Yeah, uh, why would they? Yeah. I mean, they yeah. they did phenomenally well, and some of those same families today mm. have some of that land and and have the money that they have, <laughs> you know, managed to leverage out of all the resources on that land and the sale of some of that land, and not. Any of it goes back to supporting an entire nation of people that were dependent on it. So, mm -hmm. you know, when you look at a Wampanoag family that's struggling in an apartment building, trying to make ends meet, meanwhile, someone is phenomenally wealthy mm -hmm. off of the land that should be in their family's holdings. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a constant reminder of, yeah. of how the balance has shifted and how you know, a society that was generous and allowed a small group of people to live and have enjoy military protection and, and knowledge and medicines and friendship and support, um, how in just several generations they took the upper hand and, and did not they were not reciprocal with that relationship and they were not balanced and, and 
kind people mm. like the like the folks that greeted them mm. and allowed them to continue to live yeah. on property that wasn't theirs and allowed them to eat or actually gave them food to eat and provided them with resources that they themselves didn't know how to come across or maintain. Mm. Um, yeah. I, I don't really, I don't think anyone could look at that history, you know, removing their bias or their personal opinion about race and supremacy. Mm. If you just look at individual people mm. as just equal humans, you could not look at that story and say that this was a kind and giving relationship where at the end you could feel good about the outcome. Mm. There's no one in their right mind who could say that that was the case. Mm. There are several million Mayflower descendants today and there are less than 6,000 known Wampanoag people today. Mm. I don't know how that works without genocide and imbalance and devious action and horrific war. Mm. So what do you... So, Sorry, I, go think, ahead. Go ahead. I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of reasons like that that Wampanoag people can't really look at this holiday mm. as something positive and, and meaningful mm. when we can't expect to look around our own communities and our look around the the areas of our nation today and see anything that acknowledges our people and our continuance. There's very little here that feels like home in our only home on this earth. And that in and of itself would make celebrating Thanksgiving hard to, hard to swallow. Mm. Hmm. Do you have some resources that you can share with us, with me, that people can learn from that are written by the natives or you have uh, put down some uh, stories just the way you talk to me today? Uh, there, are, there are some folks who are doing a bit of writing now. I, you know, I think establishing a relationship and mm -hmm. having conversations with indigenous people um, from various regions helps to not only teach you about maybe moments in history that that have a different perspective that have been removed from from the telling of that story, but also um, the layers of humanity mm -hmm. that you get from having a personal connection and interaction with with people not just facts and information, but an understanding of people's sense of humor, their gestures, their movements, yeah. the the sounds and the expressions that are linked to a very specific people and culture and history and and uh, how the the people actually view things. Mm. Because it's it's not just understanding that Yes, you know, people had this, this, this experience, mm -hmm. and they exist here, and mm -hmm. this is what they typically do now. Mm -hmm. But that sort of textbook understanding of people, but the actual, right. the actual connection that establishes a reason for people to honor and respect yeah. another type of, of nation and community mm -hmm. and language and yeah. right the reason that we should be getting together and talking yeah. about things and sharing and 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 establishing relationships right because it's that's what changes how societies view um the future that's i guess true. ultimately it's 
if you don't know a people, it's very easy to dismiss the need to allow them to still exist in this world. I agree. Right? Sorry, go ahead. You were saying something? Oh, I was just going to say it, it's very easy in this society. Believe, unfortunately, yeah. it's easy mm -hmm. to disregard whole groups of people, exactly. even though communication is so easily attainable now. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to disregard if you just have controls in place that keep certain people and perspectives out of the media, for instance. Uh, you know, point to any news anchors mm -hmm. on any national news channels that have an indigenous anchor mm. and deal with indigenous issues. Mm. Not one. Mm. I can't think of anyone. Mm. Where are the heroes, you know, for our people? Mm. The where the the young native children where where can they look to see people who are acknowledged globally or nationally mm. that they want to try to achieve and surpass their achievements? I it's hard. I mean, we all are forced to forge our own way mm. and and find heroes or find a path mm. that would allow us to maybe have a chance to become some of those people and yet in my whole life I have yet to see someone make it to that level and that says a lot about the society we live in mm. we're still fighting for the right to not be demonized by sporting teams and and horrific caricatures of a generalized native person yeah. making a fool of themselves as a mascot for the entertainment of the masses. And we can't say that offends us and expect anything to be done about it. Mm. We can't expect in this modern society that our women and children were, that they will be protected and safe as native women are five times more likely to be brutalized. Mm than any other people in this country. Oh. It's, it's hard to really get behind a Thanksgiving holiday or Native American Heritage Month, which is November, and still, and, and, and just feel good about that when you can't feel good about being who you are and feel protected as a citizen of the United States and feel good about what the state of affairs are for indigenous people on in this continent. It's just, it's hard. It's hard yeah. for us, yeah. I think. Yeah. As indigenous people, however, we do have our celebrations and our feasts and our gatherings. And those are far more frequent than... Then just once, then a, once, year. A, once a year, a year you know, yeah. we have our Thanksgivings mm -hmm. and our celebration and feast times, which go off of the lunar cycle. Mm -hmm. So 12 to 13 of those gatherings per year mm -hmm. based on the lunar calendar mm -hmm. uh, where you give thanks for the bounty of that period of time. Mm -hmm. And you give thanks for life and all the gifts of it. In our societies, you don't pray for what you want. You pray thank yous. Right, you give thank yous for what you have, and you work for what you want, and you try to achieve your goals. Mm. But you always give thank yous for the water every morning, the first water that nourishes you and helps to keep you alive that day. You thank the Creator and all of creation for the gift of life every day when you wake up, mm. because there will come a time when you don't. Mm. And, you know, so you want to have been thankful for every gift of every day that you had while you were given it. Mm. And, you know, those sorts of thank yous, your th thank yous for your children and your parents, your thank yous for the gift of community and thank yous for the songs and the dances that your ancestors passed down to you and for the songs and dances that you create because your ancestors are in you and, you know, they gift you with the ability to create new things. Uh, you know, all the things that you have to thank, thank the creation for, you, you take that time every day to thank. 
for life, you know, give, give thanks for life itself. And then those feasts and celebrations on the lunar calendar are just a chance to give extra thank yous and, and to dance and celebrate and to acknowledge this bigger uh, communal effort to give thanks. And so the idea and the concepts of giving things are very near and dear to all of our hearts, mm. I believe. Mm. And, you know, I certainly can't speak for all Native people, mm -hmm. but that's sort of the standard. Mm. Um, but the, you know, as far as the national holiday of Thanksgiving, it's, it's a, a loaded issue. So I, thank you I, for talking. You know, we, yes, please go ahead. No problem, go ahead. absolutely. I was just going to say, you know, for Quinawampanog people, on which is my community on Martha's Vineyard, mm -hmm. uh, we have lands in in Aquino on the island of Martha's Vineyard off the coast of Massachusetts, and we we have celebrations. We have our Cranberry Day festival, mm -hmm. and we harvest our traditional you know, out of our traditional bog area, mm -hmm. cranberries, and we have, um, that's an annual Thanksgiving celebration that we have, that we've maintained time in memorial mm. for my community. We have our sort of more open and public gathering uh, earlier in the year, on the second weekend of September every year, we have our, our gathering up at the circle in Aquina, mm -hmm. right on at the top of the cliffs mm. yeah, of Aquina. Mm -hmm. And we we dance and we sing and we feast and we have a good time then and the public is welcome to, to join us in that that gathering. Mm -hmm. And that's every year, second mm -hmm. weekend of September. Okay. So we, we still have um, our gatherings and our festivals and our celebrations. Through all the year. So yeah. Yes, and exactly. some of those some of those things are open to the public if you you know if sure. if people are interested in actually establishing a physical connection Presence to the the land that that we love and the community that we come from and the songs that we sing you know that's a good chance to to actually see who we are mm. and interact with our people and I think it's so it's you know, if we, if we spent more of our time mm -hmm. the second weekend of mm -hmm. September every year. Mm -hmm. I'll take and some links or something from The weekend from after so Labor weekend. Day. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and, and I think the more that we as a people could come together and celebrate the differences and celebrate the commonalities and establish a a relationship, as I said before, mm. an acknowledgement of of who and what we come from mm -hmm. and be able to be comfortable in who each and every one of us is and what we're connected to good and bad mm -hmm. right I mean, we all have yeah. we all have a history yeah. you know throughout our generations but you don't have a choice we were born and we're born of things mm -hmm. that you know of people and their stories mm -hmm. And so we don't have a choice in that, but we have a choice in how we're going to live our lives mm. and how we're going to, you know, create more positive engagement in this world and less negative. Mm. Uh, we have a choice in how we want to carry knowledge forward, how we want to encourage our children to carry themselves how how we do things the choices we make so that we don't continue to either perpetuate or advance the wrongs of, of the past right? mm -hmm. and i think that's making that sort of change is how we make room in wampanoag nation in wampanoag territory for wampanoag people it's making that choice right now and for the rest of our lives. Each and every one of us, all of us, that will make the deciding, it will be the decider as to whether or not 10 generations from now there could be a conversation between a Wampanoag person and uh, a person from another society or another ancestry. Hmm. And they could have dialogue and, and talk about things and views and traditions and values. Or 
there could be conversations about whatever happened to the Wampanoag people. They're all gone. Mm. And do we want to allow that? Mm. You know, do, do American people want to be celebrating Thanksgiving 10 generations from now mm. and also ask, be asking themselves whatever happened to the indigenous people? Yep, it's a very important question. If you're going to, if you're going to do religious comparisons, it, you're going, you know, that's a debate that can last a lifetime, exactly. and you typically will find that you're arguing the same thing. <laughs> you know, most religions are, you know, yes, there are people who get involved in religions throughout history. You know, spiritual practices become religious because they become ritualistic, right? And if if people with corrupt intentions get involved in the crafting of those religions, mm -hmm. then sometimes they can get a little askew. They can become sexist exactly. or they can become racist mm -hmm. or they can become classist, mm -hmm. right? And that's usually deviating from the point of the of the spiritual practice, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but really, when you boil down most belief systems to their principles, there's this, the guideline to the same thing. Yep. And it's just, it's in one person's language versus another. Exactly. It's written by, it's written or crafted by a group of people from this part of the world versus that mm -hmm. one. But ultimately, they're typically guidelines for being a good human. Yep, exactly. That's what and I if have we were, that. If we were just talking about how to be a good human and getting rid of all of the other issues, mm -hmm. And, and taking the name of a spiritual practice out of the con, you know out of the equation, just getting together as people to talk about how to you know exist and be respectful of one another and of creation, we wouldn't really be arguing too much. That's true. You right. know, yeah. it's um, so I, I totally I I completely hear you know, where you're coming from yeah. on that. And, because, you know, it's, because you can wonder, yeah. like, what? why are you interested? Do you have an agenda? Or somebody might say, why are you, like, why not? Mm -hmm. Why not? I am not feeling sorry, sorry to say. I don't feel sorry. I feel proud to talk to you. I am mm -hmm. very honored to talk to you. I want to learn from you. I want to, because mm -hmm. I noticed that there aren't many we are doing everything else. Why aren't we talking to people who belong to this, uh, this earth, this this area, this piece of land? And I want to bring the stories out, whether whatever level I am. Okay, I have no agenda in that. I just want to talk about. I want to talk about mis Muslim women, professional women who are not talked about. They are always considered oppressed, or maybe <laughs> whatever. You know, right. so I want to bring them into Which, uh, into picture. Like, okay, absolutely. they are professionals. They are contributing as an uh, immigrant. They are doing a lot, and the, those who cover their themselves or are modest doesn't mean that they are uh, you know oppressed or anything. I I I don't cover my head. So what? I am a modest person. I that's what I think. I don't reveal or you know flaunt myself. That's for me. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's that's how I like to be. So. Mm -hmm. So the, my, I, I enjoy different cultures. I, I value that and I respect mm -hmm. that. And it doesn't mean I am going to convert into this or to that. I just talked to somebody who had such an interesting background. She is Jewish, converted into Sikhism. She cares about everybody, this and the other. So what does that mean? Whatever. She is who she is, you know. Um, so sure, yeah, and that's how it is. And I, was... so I was, I noticed like nobody talks about natives or the indigenous people, like in terms of like I don't see you. Where are they? Groton has, you know, the history maybe, and whatever the whole United States has it, and we don't hardly see them. They, I now I know. Oh, you're not the, you don't look the same. You are there, but you are, you are in your own way. You have to follow the system and this and the other. You can't have the freedom of having your own ways other than uh, powwows that we I see now or I'm, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. all the... Well, there's not. Yeah. And there's not a visible space 
exactly. for indigenous people on a daily basis to be a constant reminder to the rest of the population that we're still here. Exactly. There's, there's, you know, there are some locations, if you're in Seattle, Washington, you might see native artwork and gallery space and a little more presence. If you're in Santa Fe, New Mexico, you know, if it, if it, fits the economy of the non-native population then it's a little more visible but if it doesn't fit the sort of um, economy and outward appearance of a place then mm. we're invisible mm -hmm. uh, so I really appreciate your time and thank you very much for talking to me today absolutely thank you for our wonderful conversation and I wish you uh, Many lucks. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, I don't know where I was going. That. That's I'm okay. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you for staying with me through this exciting episode. Please don't forget to subscribe and stay tuned for the next episode of Light Up with Schwa.